I've always wanted to sketch things that become products. This is like my dream has been my dream since I was a child. When I was at primary school, I had the janitor from the school leaving a wet cloth on my desk every day because he refused to clean it because every single day I had airplanes, motorbikes, whatever you name it, penned on the... So it was a tradition. End of the day, I clean my own desk because the janitor is not going to do it. And so I've always wanted to do that. And to do that, I followed a quite an unusual path for a creative person because I have a master in mechanical engineering because my back then intuition and now after 25 years of career, it's proven right, at least for me, that if you want to be able to push your creative idea, you need to have all the tools, the knowledge, the awareness, the, the information that go behind it so you can push it through a company. Welcome to 99 Humans. My name is Jeff LaCusta, curious coach and Wall Street Journal bestselling author, striving to understand how little things generate big impact. And I'm Nadia Carta, tech executive and lifestyle coach with a mission to transform lives and corporations by kindling hearts to generate a zeal for life. Each week, we investigate stories about the human side of leadership to re-energize your spirit and help you become a stronger leader. Because the reality is that leadership is messy, goofy, challenging, but always human. Thanks for spending time with us today. Let's dive in. Oh my God, welcome everybody. The conversation we're about to have today is very emotional for me because it brings me back in time, but I don't want to spoil it for Jeff. And so I want to welcome Valerio to 99 New Ones today. Ciao, Nadia. Nice again. Nice to meet you, Jeff. Very, very happy to see you both. And again, mostly Nadia, because you're such a cool, lovely old friend. So, so great to where is you. Sit, sit again, Jeff. I just said it's so great to meet you. Where does this podcast find you, Valerio? It finds me in Milan. Uh, I'm originally from very close to Venice, but I've been living in Milan for the last 28 years. Plus, I've lived in Sydney for quite a few years in Australia. But for a long time, home has been Milan. So, And that's also where I met Nadia and her lovely husband. So, yes, I'm in Milan. In the, in the design capital, being a designer, where else, let's face it. So I'm going to start with a nugget for the people listening. And it's a little story. One day I was here in New York for an advertising conference, one of those boring conferences. And as I make myself um, some coffee, I'm literally looking at the coffee machine and I'm like, wait a moment, I know this person. And literally, Valeria's name was on it, ginormous. And it was one of those moments where you feel like, I know the man. <laughs> oh, don't be silly, but yes, you're right. Sometimes the product we design bury, carry our logo. And in our logo, the, the company is, I know it's big egotistic, it's Valerio Cometti plus V12 design. So the, our logo, yes, I, I see your point. And sometimes it's embarrassing, sometimes it's quite nice. So I hope I, I, you don't mind when I just pop up in products here and there. But yeah, I, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. I think it's amazing. It's a great accomplishment. So let's kick this off, Valerio. What are you up these days? Okay, um, just to give you a, a quick... So I, I don't live on the front of coffee machines where Nadia uh, sees me. Um, I'm a designer. I've always wanted to sketch things that become products. This is like my dream has been my dream since I was a child. When I was at primary school, I had the janitor from the school leaving a wet cloth on my desk every day because he refused to clean it. Because every single day I had airplanes, motorbikes, whatever, you name it, penned on the... So it was a tradition. End of the day, I clean my own desk because the janitor is not going to do it. And so I've always wanted to do that. And to do that, I followed a quite an unusual path for a creative person because I have a master in mechanical engineering because my back then intuition and now after 25 years of career, it's proven right, at least for me, that if you want to be able to push your creative idea, you need to have all the tools, the knowledge, the awareness, the, the information 
that go behind it so you can push it through a company. So knowing how things are made, uh, the investment, the technology is paramount for my job. And that's how I started. So uh, you find me in my meeting room because as my lovely fiance and friends know, I'm a little bit of a workaholic. I, I, I Yes, I, I confess that. And so we recently had Milan Design Week a couple of weeks ago. As you know, it was the biggest creative creativity event in the world. So it's been a busy year, a busy time of the year. But I have to say that we work in so many different sectors from automotive. Ferrari is one of our biggest clients. So it can be automotive appliances, consumer electronics, eyewear. Working so many sectors means that every month there is the exhibition of the certain sector. So the, the, we are, have this stressful plateau of deadlines that follows us through the year. But I have to say, in a nutshell, with the stress that everyone who is a professional has, I do for a living what I've always wanted to do. And that is a, it's a huge boost, at least to wake up in the morning. That maybe halfway through the day, I get my depression and I, I throw things around. But the start is always, come on, someone pays you to pen the things, sketch things that will become product. So at least that is exciting. I, I'll give you that. I think that is a fascinating background because honestly, the, pe the number of people who are doing what they've always wanted to do since childhood, I mean, honestly, it's got to be way, way less than 1%. I'm somebody who wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to be, now I'm an ads person. I want to be a writer. You know, like it feels like I want to be a whole lot of different things, but then there is this very special group of people and even still, even smaller within that group who know what they want to do and pursue it all the way through. How true no, is I, it really I, I, half the whole time? I understand. You know, honesty, I never wanted to be an actor. I never wanted to be a cowboy. I never wanted to be an astronaut. Okay. I sadly, very geekily, I guess, I don't know, always wanted to design things. And I, and I phrase it so boringly because that's how it always felt. Then of course, I always wished to work for my own company. That's another element that was probably less of a childhood approach to things. But as I was structuring my career, I started my company when I was 27, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I carried on doing this uh, job, which is, again, exciting. We have uh, clients that go from six employees to 160,000. So the variety of interaction responsibility we can in the morning talk to some young startup who's trying to raise the pre-seed 50 grand and in the evening maybe at this table there's a ceo of a company that is uh, the nasdaq and blah blah so and for a creative person and a creative team because i have a team working for me you know um Variety, contamination is the turbo, the most important thing. The fact that we get to interact and work in so many different sectors with magnitude of business that are so different from nationalities because we have 60% of clients are Italian, but 40 are Chinese, Koreans, Americans. And the place where what we design is sold is literally 150 countries on average. So uh, on one hand, is there's never a dull day, but that's a bit of a silly thing to say. But in terms of like operations, it's like 100 jobs in one. Luckily, and this surprises my clients a lot, there's a very strong pattern. The things that you do, the tools, the the, the uh, mental skills that you use are surprisingly always the same. Whether you're designing a car, a bicycle, a brand, it's it's weird, I know, but after probably, I don't know, 600 projects, I can say that. So this is a little bit in a nutshell because I don't mean to bore you. It's my world. I'm going to ask you a tough question. And Valerio, I have known you for 12 years almost now. I'd, I'd probably, yeah. And there was a time where I would see you almost every day. I remember that. And I never 
saw you one time in those 12 years, losing your temper, being uncomfortable, even in situations that were extremely, extremely tough and hard and, and all that happens in life. And managing a business, I mean, especially in Italy with your business, we know that doing business in Italy is very difficult and complex. So I want to know, what's your secret? What do you take every day? What's your... I, okay, <laughs> yeah. okay, oh, okay. Uh, I, I, sadly, I can only start saying there's no secret and I don't know, but uh, let me try and build from there. Uh, you're right. I, I incredibly rarely lose my temper to the point that I could almost say that in my job, maybe let's leave the private life on the side for a second. I don't, I cannot recall once actually getting mad. And uh, I am uh, no saint. I think the only explanation I can give to myself, because I just happen to be like this, I, I don't pretend. I am very uh result driven meaning i don't believe that anger and rage are the tool that i need i could be wrong don't get me wrong maybe for some people it works everything that i'm about to say today with your lovely company it is just my opinion i'm in no position to, to give uh, laws or truths to anyone but in my experience since i find that when people get mad at me and yell at me, they don't get the best out of me. I don't see why I should use the same tool. So because I am quite strongly minded and rationally built in my brain, I'm like, what do I want? Someone to pay me, someone to do its job. The, 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 the tool, this, uh, the things that can happen in a business, the task that you need to accomplish, I never see anger being the right tool. And, and I use the word tool like a screwdriver is correct for a screw, an Allen key for something else. So that's why probably I wired my brain in very hardly finding, uh, having to re resource to anger to solve the situation. Th th that's all I can tell you because again, I don't, force any self-control i don't practice any meditation even maybe i should so i am an incredibly a basic human being okay and very weak at time i think it's just a matter of what do i need uh to that that, 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 that is it this is the only explanation i can give to myself yes i don't know if it's enough but it's the, the closest one i can come up with which also i have to say uh, um, is really closely to related to my managing style in my company. I have a, a really great business partner and a friend, and um, he comes from a background of large corporations. He was a manager at Vodafone and Hasbro. So he comes with that background, that experience. As a human being, he's probably even nicer and more polite than myself, okay? But we have often very polite conversations about the philosophy of managing a team. And maybe because of his background, he's often challenging me with, I think that pressuring and squeezing the team uh, in a legit manner, okay, is the way that will get the best out of the team. I, am on the contrary, and I cannot say he's wrong, there's plenty of successful managers to, that do that and get the best out of the team. I'm on the opposite. I'm like, I don't think that's going to work, Marco. I think that the, the way to get the best out of our team is to build on the quality of their professional existence. And if we hire emotionally clever people, they'll see, they'll appreciate these conditions that we build, and they'll naturally deliver the most. Endless, endless conversations, no one's right, no one's wrong. And I, I guess any manager has legitimate an opinion, but we run this company in a particularly uh, relaxed, uh, 
pleasant. Hopefully, it's it's a job. It's not fun. It's not a hobby. We have tight deadlines. We have like neurotic CEOs that scream at us. It's fine. But our answer to that is uh, the the best looking offices. The we have become a permanently remote working company, which is not very common, at least in Italy. So all my stuff, I eventually don't even know where they are. They need to be available online between nine in the morning and six in the afternoon. They, we have close interactions with all the collaboration tools, blah, blah, blah. But physically, no one comes in the office unless they want so. Unless, let's say, there's a physical prototype, something that we need to look and evaluate. And this came, of course, it came after COVID, but it really stems from what do we think is the best condition for our team? Just ours. We're not preaching it to anyone else. So again, I, I'm, I'm probably stretching your initial question, but just to, to give you a broader vision of how things, how I see things in business, let's say. I love that perspective. And it's interesting because we're talking to you in the midst of so much success. And <clears throat> clearly your ideas on remote work and your ideas on how much to pressure are working for you and your company. And you Just also my company. told us the seed, the spark, right? It's design. It's the love for that back in childhood that sent you on this path. But also, you, you've described because of just the scale of success that you have, cross-cultural affluence that you're clearly quite successful at, leadership and people management that you're clearly quite successful at and alluding to here, sales knowledge and skills that you're successful at, a calm, cool, collected demeanor and emotional approach. So there's a lot going for you, but it all started back as a child in that design spark. So I'm I'm wondering... As you've added tools and skills to your, you know, personal approach, what's been a time or one of those skills that was actually really hard to learn? Did it all come natural as like, oh, now I need to sell. Turns out I'm great at sales. Oh, now I need to work with China. Turns out I'm great at, or was there a moment where I was like, no, ooh, no. I need to do this and I'm bad at this? Uh, you, you, it's a very clever question and I'll try and answer as precise as I can and um, there are areas in which I'm not naturally good and probably I'm not even good, period. But to get back to your question, I am not spontaneously good at sell, at sell, at selling, at sales, just because, uh, and this is going to be very childish, I don't like to pitch myself. We are in this incredibly lucky position and i just look at the sky because i'm very thankful that the majority of the companies that work for us with us come to us because because of word of mouth mm -hmm. so we are in very rarely and it's a blessing for me in the position to pitch ourselves it happens don't get me wrong it does happen it should happen even more i'm not one of those people that is like I'm so good, people come at me, it's enough. That, that, that's not the right mindset. So we still have a business development activity. But I'm not very good at that. I'm not good at walking in a room, uh, meeting you, Nadia, let's say for the first time, and say, oh, by the way, do you know that I can design your products? And listen, blah, 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 blah. All that kind of a healthy pushiness that a salesperson needs to have. That's how you start. That I'm very weak. Okay. Another one is... I am very bad at giving bad news. It makes me so uncomfortable. And I think it's a task that a manager has to master. I was listening to one of your episodes. Again, you know, I'm a fan of your podcast in which this uh, female manager, I apologize, I don't remember her name, but she explained that in her life, I think she was in HR, she had to uh, manage large layoffs of people and the way she presented it was so emotionally well delivered that i'm sure she did a, an amazing job but i was driving as i was listening to that i felt anxiety thinking if i had to do that okay i don't know if it makes sense and of course uh, even if you don't have to fire someone sometimes you need to give a bad uh, bad news bad feedback again that is not something I'm particularly good at. So again, th there's plenty of things I'm not good. I don't know, Jeff, if I gave you 
uh, honest enough answers, but these two areas put me in the no, Valerio, in the bad side of the blackboard. Valerio, not good. I have a yeah. follow-up question to that because literally you embody all the traits that I wish I could develop in my life. Like I'm so emotional, like, you know, anger, like rage, all the stuff you described are like, oh my God, like honestly, my nervous system would be so thankful if I could be that way. But at the same time, I know that you are such an incredible and kind person. So I wouldn't go far in saying, oh, Valerio is emotionless because I know that you, you have emotions. And so given this point that you just shared about sales and, and, and delivering bad news and all of it, and, and this can be a polarizing question, so you, you can disagree and say, no, absolutely, that's not that way. But what do you say that have something to do about not liking confrontation? No, no, I, I, it's not a polarizing question. It's a very clever and legit question. I don't like confrontation, so you hit the nail on the spot. Uh, I, I, I view boxing as a sport, so I don't have any problem in facing someone in the right place. Okay. But it goes back to what I said before, back in the professional area. Uh, I don't often see confrontation as being the right tool for me. Again, you are very right. I, I don't like it and I am probably become quite good at solving the problem because I solve problems every day, uh, as you wisely also Jeff pointed out, like your job, I juggled flying dishes like a Chinese artist on a daily basis. So it's everything but, but uh, heaven. But I, I've become quite good at, okay, you are opposing me with ideas, with uh, your antagonism. I kind of try and build a side argument that slowly uh, hopefully with the right topics, uh, brings your wall down. Again, I very incredibly rare need to antagonize someone. And uh, uh, imagine that 100% of our turnover is based on subjectivity. We sell things that you legitimately may not like. That for an engineer is even more uh, concerning because I expose myself, I make pretty things and I live on the constant uh, judgment of someone say, well, you know what, I don't like it. So again, um, you train yourself, you want to punch them because you're like, you understand nothing. This is so cool. You're an ignorant, blah, blah. but you can't say that. Most of the time he's the client. So probably uh, I had to train myself into uh, um, build with words, with content, with the body language. Uh, the, 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 my argument without having to raise my voice because, again, I needed to sell beauty, let's say. Also, it's a function of beauty. I'm not an artist. And uh, never being able to raise my voice or throw my, the, the paper around the, the, the table, etc., etc. So, But, again, very clever. I, I don't love confrontation, so it, it, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious because we don't often talk to such creative, you know, you're leading with that creative set at the end of the day in your business and you're flexing lots of different skills. But what is your creative process? Because as you said, you're selling beauty, you're selling your creativity. And sometimes I would guess the creative muse doesn't come when you want it to. You sit at your desk and go, oh, I need an idea. I don't have an idea. So what does that process look like for you to be consistently creative when you need to be? I'll, again, great question. I'll, I'll, I'll start giving you the process so that I give you like a more objective answer and then I'll give you also my subjective. Um, these days, when you design, because we design products, brands, experiences. So when you design something, okay, whether it's physical or non-physical, uh, but let, let's keep it simple. Let me, let's imagine an object. Okay, so we're talking that's product design, which is what we do also the most. Um, if you want to do a good job, you need to think of it as you are designing the experience that that product will make Nadia, be Nadia, the end user, using the product. If I design a hairdryer, 
of which you can all imagine how experienced I am. If I design a hair dryer and I set my creative goal in the physicality of a hair dryer, the plastic tool, the logo, the shape, the handle, which is exactly what I will deliver. That is my output. But my view was fall short. I will need to think, and that's the big word in my business is empathy. Believe it or not. Everything in this world is empathy. Why? Because I need to be able to close my eyes, picture myself in Nadia's shoes, and what kind of experience this hair dryer would give to Nadia. She set the bar whether higher or beyond the, just the physicality. And this is all empathy because somehow on a professional level, I need to, so every design process and project has to have a clear view of the user personas who are my ideal clients. I need to somehow be able to throw myself into their lives, into their lifestyle. And this is where I am, where I aim. In this trajectory, I happen to, to have to de design a, a high dryer or a coffee machine or a car. Okay, so this, as a, a very, in broad terms, this is the process that unifies every well-done product design. Of course, there's plenty of tools and skills, but I, I want to go in boring details. So the process is always about imagining that you're designing Nadia's experience, your user, your, uh, your user persona's experience. And this unifies to everything. And this also is how we teach our new designers. This is how we convince our clients or explain how we work, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a, a surprising amount of psychology in a team that works on injection molding, die casting, assembling, raw, because that's what we do. The majority of what we do are fairly complex items. It can be a kitchen range, it can be a coffee machine, again, it can be a car, it can be a cell phone, but it's always the same. On the most subjective note, uh, so far, the creativity I don't, I don't want to call it river. The creativity creek, I want to stay very humble, has never dried. I have to say, and I changed my tone of voice because maybe one day you will. I don't know it because we change so many sectors. I, maybe because I'm so passionate about what I do. Also, don't get me wrong, maybe because I work with very talented people in my team. So I, I don't want you to think that I do everything and they nod when I walk in the room. That's not the case. So you also surround yourself with equally, if not sometimes even more talented people. But I haven't yet to these days hit the, the, the blank page wall, I'd say this. <laughs> Valeria. When it will happen, I'll call you. Not only I think that you have a river, I think you have an ocean. So it's no, definitely no. not a creek. Because, no. I mean, from when, when I listen to what you're saying, even if I would have never met you before, it's very clear. Like this was the life purpose that you've been given from whatever forces are out there. And you've been so honest and authentically accepting in it, embracing in it, and going for it. So there's, I, I don't see a scenario where you'll be like, oh, I don't know what to build anymore. Okay, now I see your point. I also want to be a little bit honest here. And again, I'm no psychologist. I'm a very uh, simply built person inside, okay? So don't. But I also have to say that uh, I think I owe a lot of this uh, uh, balance, let's say, to my family, to my parents. Because I, I, again, I'm very ignorant, but I believe that we all bear a big load, given positive, negative, neutral, indifferent, exciting, frustrating. Okay. I would be very unfair if I didn't acknowledge that I had, I still have, luckily, pretty insane parents, incredibly strict. I do remember my mom reaping my homework when I was a child because the writing wasn't correct. So 
have grown with a willingly very high bar, but with so much stimulation, uh, consideration, uh, praise once I hit that bar. I don't, I think I would be very unfair in this adore, lovely analysis that we're doing in not acknowledging that because I think that it's a huge boost that an individual gets. So then I also rolled my sleeve and did a, uh, my, I guess, a good job. But I think, yeah, I had a very, yeah, a very good platform in terms of feeling. Not, not, my, my dad used to have a small real estate agency hundreds of miles away. So I didn't uh, inherit any professional uh, push in my sector. But in terms of how I'm built inside, yeah, I think I owe them a lot. I don't know if it makes sense, but uh, it makes yeah. sense. How do you navigate? that high bar as a leader because i would guess that you're ultimately in charge of these are the designs and if they don't meet it are you ripping up the design going go back to the drawing board or have you, you see, found no, some no, other strategy to keep the bar high while no, still no, no, you, feedback? The, the, there's no uh, clever idea it is Elliot, you said if one uh, someone's proposal is not right it just doesn't go through but uh, there's different ways in rejecting a proposal. I, on a daily basis, work beside companies where I'm exposed to hundreds of style of management style. Because imagine that I live inside other people's company, so I do know how, the different ways of rejecting an idea. Mm. I rejected, but I try to make it. Unless I see that someone has been neglecting that task, but it doesn't happen because I think I hire very clever people, blah, blah, blah. But the rejection is there. It's like, no, guy, this, this, I don't like it. Try, try again. That's it. But I try to deliver it in a way that is never frustrating, is never a slap on the wrist. We try, we try, and I say we because also there's a pretty cool business partner I work with. If someone's idea gets approved by the client and it wasn't mine, they need to know immediately. There's no way, oh, I absorb your idea becomes mine. It becomes the company's idea, don't get me wrong. But rewarding someone because I like being rewarded, not because I'm a better person, is so important for us. Yeah. This morning we did a presentation. It went particularly well. I did the presentation myself because of several reasons. I couldn't rush fast enough on my phone, sending messages, congratulations, everyone sharing that the client was all over the moon. Literally, I, my teams were almost still open with the client because I know that I would feel so well if someone did that to me that I have to do that on, on the people. Mm -hmm. But if something is not right, it's not right and we carry on working on it. I have a, I love what you just said. You're a leader that everyone would want to work for. No, and so. I have a question. There is a three-part question. So let's see if I can build it in a way. I have, I have pen and paper or as any designer <laughs> should do. So I write notes. So number one is, have you, because you, you said the clients come to you and, uh, uh, you know, these years and all of that. And I've been wondering, have you ever got a client or a request that was not aligned with your values that you said, I cannot build this product because it's against who I am and who I was. I don't want to do it. And if not, what is a product that you would never design, even if they were to pay you, to pay you several millions? And then last is, on the contrary, what would be a product that you are dreaming of designing in it and then you would like to attract as your client's roster? So I know it was a long one, but I'm no, 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 no. Um, Okay, so I'm, 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 I'm writing down, taking notes. Sorry, Nadia, I'm with you. <laughs> um, the, okay, luckily, we have not yet ever received a request that uh, didn't align with our values, not because our values are particularly loose, but because we haven't received anything inappropriate, let's say. Um, I think the most outlandish thing, which I hope I don't offend anyone, but it was very cool for us, was a sex toy. And we 
The project didn't go through, but we would have done it so happily because I can only, I don't see anything wrong with it. Very careful. From... You know that I want to spin spark your zeal into other domains. So, okay, you, you, you have my number. You have my number. So, <laughs> other than that, which again was an absolute welcome addition to our portfolio, no, um, luckily we never had anything that made us feel uncomfortable. Uh, on to the second related, second third of your question. Uh, I think we would feel uh, uncomfortable if we were to work on weapons. And I make a little specification. I would do this on, on, on a moral base, although, and it's sad to say, uh, ob objects like guns, rifles, a very fascinating object from the design point of view. Uh, so part of me as an actual design purist would be like, ooh, that would be a lovely project, mm -hmm. but I would probably, it hasn't happened to us. This wouldn't apply, of course, to sports gun, like rifle for shooting, like in sports Olympics. But if we perceived that a, a weapon of all sorts, it, its purpose was yeah, what sadly weapons sometimes do, I think we would struggle a little bit. It's never happened, so it's hypothetical, but I think I would give you this as an answer. There are still nowadays quite a few projects I would love to work on. And uh, uh, I, some are big and obvious, like a, a boat, a sailboat. I would like, I, I'm, a, I'm a mad motorbike rider. I'm insane. Please, let's not start talking about motorbikes, otherwise your podcast goes on for five hours. So I will probably definitely need to happily work on a motorbike, although something might be coming along that way. But also, less exciting things that will make you... I would like to design a revolutionary scissor. There's a fascination in designing the most ridiculously obvious projects that have not evolved for a few hundred years. Your brain is like, these things have been done... Because if you think about scissors, Maybe they have a sharp point. Maybe they have a rounded point, but they're all the same. There's a fulcrum in the middle. You put these two fingers and you cut paper. And it's been like this for a good 600 years. So maybe if someone came to us and said, listen, I don't want it to be prettier or sharper or longer. It has to be a blue ocean type approach to you. So just to make an example, there's also very mundane products that sometimes I'm like, is this the only way to do it? And, uh, and we'll see, we've done uh, some pretty innovative manual coffee grinders. Just to name something incredibly mundane, they won uh, awards worldwide for the ingenuity. So it can be something uh, very boring or quite exciting. Uh, and th th there's still quite a few. Absolutely. There's absolutely plenty of projects that, that, that we would like. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So... Uh, I hope I've touched all three segments of your question. You Please did. design better scissors. So my husband and I run a trivia company. And so we cut okay. lots of pieces of paper. And they okay. these are very functional. They're not comfortable. If you do a lot of cutting, it is not like a natural hand motion to go like there this. Go. So See? I'm with you. That's such a funny thing okay. that resonates okay. with me. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, uh, it makes sense. And there's probably a few thousand designs of scissors these days. But maybe I, I think there would be room for, for, for another one. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. For our clients, I'm going to commission a sex toy for Spark Your Zeal, and Jeff is going to commission scissors for his company. Done. Yeah. See, see, that was, got, a, very, yeah, exactly. was a, a very good. Good sales right there. Okay, Valerio, oh, yeah, we're, getting, yeah. we're getting close to time, and I think you know the last question that we always ask, but I want to ask it in a way because I acknowledge your incredible humility throughout this podcast. But I want you to imagine that your leadership style is the right one, that okay. you have homed into some magic formula of leadership. And thinking of that, you interact with so many other leaders out there. What advice do you have for leaders who are listening to this, assuming that your style of leadership is correct? Which is a, a very bold assumption, guys. The, 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 <laughs> That's the, why I say it. Yeah. Don't, don't tell anyone. Don't tell. Oh, Valerio told me. No, no, no. Valerio does his thing. Then well, you'll up. be live on the podcast. So whoever <laughs> listened to it. 
please don't take note. But again, back to your question. Um, if because I'm uh, happily exposed to some really, really big managers, CEO, like people that run the destinies of thousands of people. Uh, if I were to name one thing and only one, and then I go back in my box is I really hate, really hate in a, because I find it unproductive, not hate in a, in a, in a skin level way. L listen more. What I can't stand is there's a room, there's a big table, there's the big boss, there's the board of the company, whether it's big or small, we all know a hierarchy in a company. Hey, you've got your marketing person, you've got your sales person, you've got your specialist. And you decide for everyone else. I'm like, so why do you pay them? So not listening, but, 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 but truly, no, not just like, okay, tell me your idea. And, and you can see in their eyes that, I mean, you are both very experienced professionals. So I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. So I find the value of listening immense and uh, very undervalued. Sorry for the, when, when you start climbing the, climbing the ladder in big corporations or, or, or mid-sized companies, I think is a really cool thing. It doesn't mean that you cannot have your opinion, but go through a phase of honest, sincere, meaningful listening and then ignore them. So I don't know if it makes sense, but if I were to name one, I would, I, I would almost be so arrogant to say that it, it could help. Mm, I, I don't see a Valerio arrogant ever. I mean, what are no. you talking about? <laughs> oh, no, no. Uh, so yes, <laughs> listening. Possible. No, but, but listening, yeah, I, I'm a big fan. I'm a very opinionated person. I'm one of those who, because again, I, I really want to break this idea of Valerio is a lovely guy because I'm not. I'm one of those people that, if you're doing something, crawl beside you and like, um, you know what? I think you could do it this way. So I'm also a very annoying person, guys. Come on. No, 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 no. Let, let's send the right message because I'm one of those people that thinks I can do things a little bit better than you. Okay. I love that. Yes. Nonetheless, uh, I, when I listen, I, I, I mean it. And then maybe I stick to my opinion and maybe I still think that I will do things better than you. And I'm working on it, okay? Uh, but I do listen. And I eventually come back uh, or the following day. Oh, listen, yesterday I told you this, but I thought about it. And no, I take it back. I now agree with you. Which is fine. It can also happen 24 hours after. Or, so, yeah. But again. I will trust I'm... you with my life. So, that, that's <laughs> what you said. Where can people find you, Valerio? What are, what are your socials, your websites? I want everyone to know. We have a nicely run LinkedIn page. We're not very social, let's face it, I'll give you that. But on LinkedIn, my own Valerio Cometti page and then the company V12 Design page are uh, nicely run. We try and not do them as a commercial flag. We try and be relevant also on a commercial, with a commercial purpose, but through content, so I, I would say that LinkedIn is probably where we, we look the best. And of course, our website, V12 Design, is there. And then we have a healthily, a nicely run Instagram page. That's it. No Facebook, but probably the website and our LinkedIn, V12 Design, or my personal one, is where we, we look a bit shiny, let's face it. Amazing. We'll absolutely put links in the show notes. Valerio, thank you, thank you, you so guys. much. I enjoy getting to be a small part of this little reunion that happened here live too. Well, it was the we most important thing also for me. Valerio's the beautiful goddess. If she's there, say hi. She's around. I think she just left. I will. I will. I will. I, she knew we were catching up, but she sent you her love. The bar. I mean, yes. Love so you I, will, I will say hello to her. Absolutely. I hope I can see you in the summer. I haven't seen you in ages, and I miss Let's you. Let's try and make it happen. Also because I want to see you. Fabio, okay? So send, send him a big hug. Thank you. Thank Valeria. you very much to both of you. Lovely spending some time with you. With my silly idea. Thank you. Okay. This was ciao. incredible. Ciao. Thank bye. you very much. Ciao, 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 ciao. Mm. So fun. I love 
when you can reconnect with an old friend and, and see that magic between the two of you and be a part of it. He was fantastic. Ah, oh, well, you you were amazingly part of it too, Jeff. I'm so glad that you got to meet Valerio. He is one of my favorite people ever. Um, uh, uh, it's not a fun story, but a story is that back in the days, I used to have a company with Valerio's girlfriend, with Kimi, uh, whom I adore. And uh, Valerio really helped us in moments where we had a lot of confrontations, a lot of decisions to be taken and all things. And um, that that's something, I don't know, it is a man that I've always regarded as a kind of a safe heaven, mm. you know, because he is the way he conducts himself. And I mean, this is how he is. Like he's, he's not that he, he put a facade for the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> this is how he is. It's pretty incredible. There's something too, I think that demeanor of that calm, cool, collected that attracts people to want to work for you, people to want to come to you for advice, for counsel. Uh, so just as, you know, leadership values and styles, at least I would guess that this is a part of that magnetism. I, I agree. I think so too. You're very right. Well, Nadia, what are you taking away uh, of many things, what would you say is your is your top takeaway from that conversation? Mm, I'll say one that you don't expect that I say. Okay. You know, when at the very beginning he said, uh, well, he was speaking about anger and rage, uh, rage not being tools uh, that he uses and, and needs and all of that. But there was a point after that where he said, it's a job and the job needs to be done. And... I know you and I spoke about this also in another show, but I believe we are in a time where I do admire and I do, you, you know, I'm very fond of bringing your emotions forward and, and we spoke a lot about empathy also in this episode today. So I'm all for authenticity and vulnerability and all of that. And... I think at times we need to remember ourselves, this is a job and you got to do it and you got to do it at your best. Yeah. And I feel myself too often caught into spiraling. Oh, I'm not happy or this or that. And, you know, last night I stayed awake until 1030 PM because I was working on a presentation that I needed to deliver this morning after a 12 hours day in the office. So I was pretty exhausted. But then I looked myself in the eyes and I said, it's a job, you gotta do it, you'll do it, and then you'll sleep. Now I'm not advocating for restless nights or things like that. You know, I'm very in the forefront of the, the work-life flow and all of that. But I did like particularly the stoicism associated to it's a job, you gotta do it. Yeah. So bringing back that more rational part of working, I kind of really appreciated it today. And it hits especially hard coming from him who's working in his childhood passion area because that's the reality. Even when you're working in something you love, there are elements of it that are a job. You can love the, you know, the envelope around it and everything, but sometimes you're just going to have to roll up your sleeves, as he said, and, and get to work. I like that. Amen. What about you, Jeff? Well, of course, I like his his lesson at the end, but uh, which was to listen, listen more. And I don't think that happens enough, but it hit and it reminded me I would just spent the week uh, with my team and there was a group of 60 different people in this role, all of their different managers. And of course, we're bringing out the red carpet of leaders coming to speak to them and all of that. And I usually am quite a talker. I always have a question. I can always have something that I think adds to the conversation. Uh, and yet, I really challenged myself to sit back and let the room go because these are 60 people that have never gotten together before. And frankly, they don't have nearly the opportunities to engage with some of the folks who are coming to talk to them as I do. And yet I notice there's still quite a few leaders in the room who always have to be the first to talk. And one in particular where with a particular leader asked the first question, asked the third question, asked the fifth question. I was like, what is going on? We have all these people who never get the chance to ask a question. And it reminds me that 
I think leaders do sometimes live in a different planet. And so they ask different questions and often they're great questions, but there is so much value in just shutting up and letting other people have the floor and seeing what you can learn from what's going on, maybe on that other planet, maybe for that other person. It doesn't really matter at that point or it didn't matter what needed to be answered for this person. And it was much more about the other folks in the room. But that was sort of a misconnection. And I think I only recognized that and put it all together by choosing over the week to be quiet and then hearing it from him, the value of listening. I was like, oh, yeah, look at that. I can see it happening right here. (laughs) Mm, So nice. And um, you're right. It's funny. You just uh, reminded me that back in the days, I don't know, five or six years ago, I was the one asking a lot of questions on so many things. And now I feel like, you know what? I just want to be quiet and listen. Yeah. And it's different whether you're listening or not, which I loved uh, that he brought that home. Not, you know, you got to really listen. That's hard work still. (laughs) Especially if you pay a board millions. Yeah, totally. Everybody, thank you for listening to this episode. I missed you, Jeff, as we had some episodes solo. I'm so grateful that we reconnected today. If you like the show and the episode, give us five stars. It really helps us keep this going. As you know, we have very few episodes left. We've been enjoying this ride, and we are getting ready to write our book. So stay tuned for all of our news, and thank you for being a 99 Humans lover. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.